Hi, Bula, and welcome to our Democratic Development in Melanesia webinar series, webinar three. Uh, apologies, uh, we will be starting officially in the next uh, five minutes. Uh, please bear with us. Uh, we should be getting this sorted very soon and starting. Thank you. Probably I'll also just give a small background of our speakers. Uh, we've got William Token from uh, Trans International Transparency International uh, Vanuatu, and we've also got William Nasak, the chairperson for Vango, uh, Vanuatu Association of Non-Government Organization. Uh, I understand that uh, we are all waiting anxiously for the topic, uh, Intrigue and Corruption in Vanuatu. We are just waiting for our moderator to join in and then we should be getting it all started. This uh, apologies from our end, apologies from International Idea. We will be getting this uh, started in the next uh, two to three minutes. Thank you.
Hi, hello, uh, Bula, and welcome to International Ideas uh, Democratic uh, Development in Melanesia webinar series, uh, 2022. Uh, this is our third webinar in the webinar series. Uh, it's on intrigue and corruption in Vanuatu. Um, on behalf of International Ideas Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, I would like to welcome you all who have joined us this morning for the second webinar, for, sorry, for the third webinar of the Democratic Development in Melanesian webinar series 2022. This webinar series is part of International IDEA Asia and the Pacific Regional Program Work Plan for 2022. The webinars aim to provide opportunities to citizens of the Melanesian region to take part in the substantive dis discussions surrounding democracy in Melanesia. It is also intended that through the webinars, citizens of Melanesian countries who participate may gain knowledge on the subject matter and on the ex experiences of other countries. This will in turn enhance debates on institutional and pro procedural improvements in their respective democracies. Why we are doing this uh, webinar series? Transparency International 2021 Corruption Percep Perception Index reveals the need for urgent action in the Pacific to address corruption. From Fiji to Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea and the Solomon's corruption is threatening the rights and freedom of Pacific Islands. Positive, positive efforts are being made by the Pacific governments and leaders to tackle corruption such as the adoption of the Tei Naiwa vision by the Pacific Islands foreign leaders in 2021 and the passing of key laws nationally. But the Pacific needs more significant actions more quickly to ensure progress translates into results. With a score of 45, Vanuatu remains stagnant on the CPI high value, vulnerable to the impact of natural disasters it was hit the hardest by Cyclone Harold at the peak of COVID-19 pandemic. Since its independence in 1980, Vanuatu has been politically volatile. The frequent motions of no confidence filed against the government, political instability has contributed to an environment rife with bribery, nepotism, and misappropriation of funds. In a positive, development, the country is taking steps to engage citizens in public service delivery with the aim of improving efficiency and effectiveness. However, implementations of the necessary legal policy and other anti-corruption frameworks remains a challenge. For example, difficulties with the implementation of a right to information right. Concerns of a timely fulfillment of information requests to ensure reforms such reach across the islands to support and engage remote populations. The government needs to build up a stronger partnership with key civil organizations. We have some house rules. The webinar will have two speakers who will deliver their presentation first, and then the audience will have 30 minutes after both the speakers have presented to ask questions. Audience can use the right raise hand feature to ask questions. The audience are reminded to keep their mics off during the webinar and only on it when asking questions. Also, audience can uh, post questions through the chat feature. We will... Uh, sorry. Um, we also have a disclaimer. The statement views or opinions expressed in the presentation do not necessarily represent the institutional position of international idea, its board of advisors, or its council of member states. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll give the floor to Mr. Willie Token, uh, who will be starting first from Transparency International uh, Vanuatu. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vikesh and, uh, and the team at the International IDA. Thank you for uh, giving us this chance to, uh, to articulate on this issue of uh, democracy in, uh, in Melanesia, especially uh, on the point of view of the uh, NGO or uh, as a CSO. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, I will uh, I will start up, uh, with the uh, I will follow the the notes that uh, you gave me. So can I have my uh, first slide, please? Yes, uh, Mr. Token. I'll share the screen. Okay, thank you. Let's have the second one, please. I'm sorry. Okay, I, I just want to uh, uh, start by uh, giving, uh, uh, just thinking a little bit about CPI, Corruption Perception Index. Uh, in my understanding, this is a, a perception of uh, corruption. Uh, it's an index to indicate that uh, whether it's going up or going down, whether we're fighting corruption or not. Uh, a lot of people uh, sort of uh, ignore it as a, a foreigner's a perception of uh, corruption in Vanuatu. Uh, but uh, having been with the transparency and uh, CSO uh, in Vanuatu for a almost a decade now, uh, I have taken a, a different view because I think it actually means a lot. Uh, so even though it's just a perception, when people try to uh, uh, discuss it, they uh, sometimes they dwell on the word perception, so maybe it doesn't uh, carry uh, much weight. But when you combine it with uh, the global corruption barometer like the one we had last year, it actually means a lot. Uh, if, if anybody has seen the <coughs> global corruption uh, parameter of, of last year, <coughs> it, uh, it actually shows that uh, governments in the Pacific uh, and the 10, 10, uh, the 10 countries that were uh, surveyed for the global corruption parameter, they, they actually have a lot of work to do to fight corruption. Uh, and then, uh, you know, like I said, when you're on the ground and you see, you see things like uh, Cyclone uh, Harold or Cyclone BAM uh, assistance being diverted to uh, staff of the NDMO or the health uh, staff of health instead of going to the community, it actually uh, begins to make sense when uh, when we talk about the importance of uh, CBI. We actually have uh, people, never not to uh, senior aid coordinating people in prison now, uh, or some were prosecuted because of the uh, corrupt activities when sorting out assistance during this uh, uh, this event. So it. We, we shouldn't we shouldn't just say it's a, because it's a, just a perception uh, sort of put it aside when we combine it with the global corruption barometer and uh, when we see things happening on the ground it actually means a lot it should be a warning to governments and privates and the people uh, that we have a lot of work to do to fight corruption uh, can i have my next slide please Thank you, uh, because, okay. So from 2007 until uh, 2021, 
with one or two has been stagnant around the lowest was uh, 29, but, uh, but it's been around 43, 44, 45. Uh, we're gonna be launching uh, the 2022 and I'm, with what we have, uh, we have seen happening in the community and in government now, I'm looking forward to something beyond, uh, a little bit higher than 45 of last year. Uh, but like uh, Vikas uh, mentioned it uh, earlier on, it's uh, we we are not tired, but we keep repeating ourselves that the government needs to do some work. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, it, it, when we're not improving or we're going up and down along the same uh, uh, from between 43 and 40, 45, 46. It means that uh, we are we actually uh, sometimes we take a step forward and we take a, uh, a few steps backward in the in the way we tackle uh, corruption, and and it's evident in uh, in a lot of ways. Sometimes uh, the transparency for not to is is very blunt about it. We sometimes the, the we are, we are we remind the government that. You know, they make a the government makes a statement that we need to do this, and then something happens. So it seems like uh, we we've all been saying that you know when you say something you have to do it, you have to do as you say. You don't do, say something and expect other people to do it, and you do the exact opposite. So probably uh, uh, this is I will uh, touch a little bit more on this, but this is probably the reason why we are hovering around is 40s and never go to going to 50 or 60s like countries, uh, other countries have done. Okay, thank you. If you guys can have the next slide, please. Okay, some, uh, some of the factors, and this is not exclusive. This is uh, something that we talk about on a daily basis with uh, transparency and uh, William will uh, probably uh, uh, allude to some a little bit earlier on. Uh, yeah, it has been around that uh, some people have been saying that Vanuatu is, is a champion in signing international conventions on anti-corruption work, anti-human uh, rights and uh, people's rights. Uh, but uh, enforcement is a, is a big issue. Uh, so, like I said, we go and sign things, and we we look. The Vanuatu looks like it's doing a lot of uh, good things. It's on the right direction, and then uh, we do something uh, that takes us one or the two steps backward. So, I'll just name a few here: weak anti-corruption institutions. We have uh, the audit department. We have the uh, ombudsman's office. We have the FIA Financial Intelligence Unit. We have the uh, big uh, CSO organization uh, that uh, William heads, Vanco. Uh, we all talking and uh, uh, you know advocating on the anti-corruption work, anti-corruption issues, and human rights and other rights, but actually. Uh, implementing uh, things or move, getting things forward or prosecuting uh, people or revealing things, uh, corrupt activities is, is not happening uh, like it should. Uh, so it has a lot of a few things. One is sometimes uh, these institutions are weak because financially they don't have the capacity to, to sort of uh, do what they should do. For example, the ombudsman office, uh, they don't have the capacity to even go out and only recently they're doing it, but in the past few decades or so, they cannot even go out and uh, tell people what they're supposed to be doing. Even accessing their services is, uh, is a big problem for uh, non, uh, ordinary citizens. So this is what I mean when I say weak anti-corruption uh, institutions. Inadequate uh, civic education. I think William will mention it a little bit uh, later on, but uh, a lot of people, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of people 
75% of the population of Vanuatu live in the rural areas. Only about 20, 25% live in the urban. Okay, right now we, we have put uh, social media, so information is going out. But actually going out like we do, or CSOs do, William, like I said, William will tell you a little bit more, and actually giving correct and up-to-date information to the people in the community is still uh, not adequate. So a lot of people don't know, uh, they don't know what's happening in Villa. So, you know, we, we, we might have corruption, we, we have uh, state ministers uh, prosecuted and sentenced. People in the community don't know that. So they keep voting for the right people, uh, for the same people to come to, uh, to go back to parliament. So this is what I, I mean when we say, I say uh, inadequate civic education. It needs to be strengthened and it needs to reach out a little bit more from, from experience. Uh, transparency. Uh, I, I keep telling the government, transparency, uh, volunteer workers and civic educators, they go to some places that uh, common services don't go, to, don't reach. These places, uh, they, reach, they see uh, government officials every four years when they go to campaign and uh, when, they go, uh, when they bring the ballot box to vote, for the people to vote. So this is what I mean. Uh, on the third point, lack of protection for whistleblowers. Yes, uh, last year, if uh, if you uh, some of you can recall, we had a bill passed in the parliament called libel bill. It needs it still needs to be tested. Uh, maybe it has some uh, some merit. Uh, Transparency wrote to the president, requesting him not to sign it into a uh, law because it goes against the uh, constitutional rights for freedom of expression. But uh, the president went ahead and uh, signed it, so it is now law. But uh, people, some people are still scared to, to whistleblowers. Even though we have the RTI uh, Act in place now that gives some protection to whistleblowers, it is not enough. So a lot of people are afraid to talk out to speak out against uh, corrupt uh, activities. Uh, number four, weak government tendering system. When you have this uh, perception from uh, our donors, it is, it, it, this, this plays a big part in it, the weak government tendering system. On the ground, I can tell you that when uh, when you are the minister of uh, pub, uh, public infrastructure and uh, public utilities, ministry of infrastructure and public utilities, you're the most powerful person in the, in the government. Even though they have a tender board, chairman of the uh, tender board, a lot of times it's a uh, favoritism is, uh, is practice. So you have, uh, I have been to many uh, press uh, conferences with uh, community leaders who, are, who come to the leader of opposition and question him on why there's a, there's a, government, uh, there's a government structure in the village, but the politician will go and award uh, tenders to uh, political supporters. So uh, this is one, one thing that one, uh, Transparency International of Manatu wants to uh, tackle next year to see how the tendering, common tendering process is, uh, is done and if we can uh, improve on it. Uh, number five there is a lack of enforcement on financial management legislations. Uh, it seems that, uh, you know, for example, uh, a former prime minister two years ago he signed and he prepared, uh, his government prepared uh, a fund for uh, uh, road, road, maintain, uh, road, road work on one of the islands, his island actually, so he knows how much money was appropriated by the government and passed in parliament. Last week, he, he's still an MB, he went and uh, he, he was surprised to hear that uh, the amount of uh, money that was supposed to be for this uh, 
road work was 80 million. So he, he was shocked because the amount that he knows that was appropriate for this work was around 170 million. So you have to question where did the 90 million uh, want to go? So this is what I mean. You know, uh, there's a financial management process and it, it actually, it should be strengthened. It's very weak now. That's why we have all these corrupt activities going on. One, one big issue that uh, has always been, uh, has actually put some people in, uh, in jail is public servants, people working for the government, handling uh, budget, handling aid, uh, fun, uh, funds coming from overseas. Uh, they actually own businesses on the side. So a lot of times uh, they work with the businesses and it's called what, nepotism or favoritism. And uh, a few people are actually in jail now because of these corrupt activities. Uh, and number seven, I cannot uh, miss that out. Uh, some of the factors behind all this uh, corruption is political favoritism. Uh, you know, you belong to a political party, you you benefit from it. Uh, thank you, uh, Vikas. Can I have uh, my next slide, please? How does political instability contribute to, to corruption? Uh, you know, I've been asked this uh, question a lot of times, especially when we have a cultural uh, practice in Vanuatu that uh, when somebody is uh, doing a function like is uh, organizing a wedding or there's a death in the family, everybody go and contribute. But nowadays it's this practice is, uh, and uh, sorry, and when somebody else, uh, when you have a problem, these some people come around and help you as well. It's called reciprocating. Uh, but nowadays, this practice is abused because uh, it's only practice during uh, election time, campaigning time. Uh, so it's actually more like bribery and vote buying than uh, the traditional and cultural practice that used to happen before. Uh, but, but, but it's a big issue because our people in the community, they have respect. So, you know, Last year, I, we were on one of the islands and uh, after we talked about bribery and vote buying and uh, you know, you shouldn't be uh, re uh, receiving uh, this kind of uh, uh, things from uh, politicians. After we talked, this, the, the chief of the community stood up and said, okay, but you tell me I shouldn't vote for this person, but he gave me uh, 5,000 wadu. How can I not vote for him? You know, these people have a lot of respect. Uh, so it, it's a big issue. Uh, civic education is important. The importance of voting and voting for the right person. And also uh, my number two, two point here is inappropriate appointments to post in government and statutory bodies. We are in a lot of problems with our national airline now because there are people in the, on the board who are making big decisions. These people are, they're not qualified. You don't have uh, qualified people there who, who are accountants or economists or people who have done uh, a lot of work in the airline. Uh, so, so right now our airline, national airline is in a big, uh, the prime minister call it a mess. It's a big mess because of the management. So you you wonder why these people get appointed to this post if they're if they're not qualified. Uh, it's not just a government post, but even uh, in uh, in public service, there's a saying uh, among our public servants. Sometimes when something goes wrong, we we say wrong place, wrong person in the wrong place, uh, because sometimes. The post is advertised, plenty of people applied. Even the person who sometimes who was not uh, shortlisted, 
finally gets appointed to the to the post. So uh, these are some of the things that are cost, uh, contributing to corruption. But this bit, to getting these people there is because of political instability. You know, it's uh, whoever gets into power manages to get all these people together, get their support, and that's how we uh, they get into power. Uh, and then my last point there is lack of uh, law enforcement. I was talking to uh, our public prosecutor uh, last year or beginning of this year. Right now, uh, maybe because he's a foreigner, he's dealing with cases from 1980s. And finally, he's he, he spent about four years here now, so he's finally getting things done because uh you know uh complaints and uh are not processed so people uh people uh people get away with corrupt activities um you know we we hear of uh, the last few months or so we we hear uh, we hear you you might have heard about plenty of our director generals being moved around uh you know it's sad because you know if somebody does something wrong, they should be removed or penalized. Instead, they move to another position. So you wonder how he's going to perform in another position when he cannot perform here. So you know, if in transparency, we we say no to corruption, no to impunity. If you do something wrong, you you should be penalized or you should be removed. It means you you're in the wrong place. Thank you. I might be going on with time. So I think, is that my last slide, uh, Vikash? Yes. Thank you very much. And uh, I will, uh, I'm, I'm here to uh, answer any questions that I can. If I don't have answer, then I'll, I'll let you know that uh, I can find the answer. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. One talk, Willie, thank you very much for uh, that wonderful presentation. Uh, and um, it's it's caught quite a lot of attention because I have uh, on my list now about five questions already for you. Um, some of them very specific to the points you just made earlier about um, the need for civic education and the need for better awareness. Uh, but I am going to keep these questions until after uh, Mr. Nasak has spoken just to try and consolidate our Talanoa uh, period for as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> and just before we go on to uh, Mr. William Nasak, who is, of course, our second speaker, I would like to apologize on behalf of myself um, for the technical difficulties that delayed me coming uh, online this morning. Um, but uh, just in case it hasn't been uh, done already, I'd just like to thank everyone for, for your attention. This has been quite uh, an exciting webinar series the third of a series um, aimed at encouraging uh, substantive conversations in, in our Melanesian region um, so that we can find ways uh, to address um, the difficulties we face in and around the anti-corruption space. Um, as uh, my colleagues at um, international idea uh, might have mentioned earlier um, this is uh, th this 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 um, webinar series which started uh, a few weeks back is specifically aimed at enhancing um, public discourse and, and national conversations uh, in the hope that the institutions that exist in our Melanesian countries uh, might be strengthened and so um, we're very fortunate that mr. Tokon has been able to speak quite uh, um, substantially about uh, the challenges that exist in uh, Vanuatu because of course uh, we have covered uh, Papua New Guinea, we covered the Solomon Islands and this week of course we're looking at um, the situation in Vanuatu specifically uh, given uh, Vanuatu's corruption perception index with a score of 45 and so to talk to us first 
further about that and to give us an explanation for um, why things may be the way they are in terms of where Vanuatu is at, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, our next guest speaker, Mr. William Nazak, who is, of course, going to speak about um, the uh, uh, index that, uh, the position on the index that Vanuatu currently holds, uh, the kind of reforms that may be taking place and whether or not they're enough, uh, and uh, what role or what impact the civil society organization uh, in Vanuatu have been able um, to make, but also looking at some of the difficulties that they're facing. Um, and like I said, we've got quite a lot of questions that have come in. So, Mr. Nasak, we're going to go straight to you now, and after that, come back to our Talanoa. Welcome uh, to this webinar series, Mr. Nasak. You're currently still on mute, sir. Uh, good morning. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, basically, with findings um, that has shown that Vanuatu on the corruption perception index, uh, on the, well, the views are that um, it shows Vanuatu still has a serious corruption problem. Um, by saying that, it means, oh, well, Vanuatu has done some progress in fighting corruption, but uh, I think um, it gives the idea where we don't want to be too high. We have to actually give a, a view that um, Vanuatu has still got a lot of work to do. And I think it also gives an indication to the, to the country as a whole that um, we need to work on what we have done well and we have to continue to strengthen those process and our internal process. And I think another thing is that we should look at our legislation, our existing legislations to maybe do a gap analysis so that um, we can identify gaps, loopholes, and then try to strengthen the existing legislation. Uh, on the view of what, is, uh, what reforms have taken place, and if they're adequate, are adequate um, we have recently passed in parliament a right to information act. Um, the ombudsman has now taken the over, the responsibility of looking at the and, uh, leadership code, the annual returns, and also looking at the management and admins of public institution. We also have a decentralization act. And what I'd like to say here is that there is a will political will to address uh, corruption, uh, corruption risk. And we're trying to look and improve our transparency, accountability in private sectors, our public sector, and by engaging communities. However, uh, the government it needs to take a critical step here. It can't be, um, uh, it has to continually drive the, uh, drive uh, what it's doing in a consistent manner. And how does the civil society organizations went on to aid in fighting corruption? Uh, most uh, government legislations have been amended to include um, Van Gogh as a board member. And we currently speak out uh, about advocating on issues that affect the communities. Uh, before I jump onto the next slide, I'd just like to say here is that as a civil society umbrella organization, we can't be jumping up and down and talking about corruption within the government if we can't get ourselves in order. And in that, I'll move on to my next slide. Uh, our internal governance with the, which has um, been a big obstacle in for um, NGOs um, and CSOs fighting for, fighting against corruption is that we have a very weak governance structure. I think uh, Van Gogh, as an umbrella organization has been, has suffered the, um, also with uh, malpractices and part of the corruption. And that has actually limited Van Gogh in actually fulfilling its duty as an umbrella organization. It has limited resources. And currently with a new board that has been appointed, uh, we need to actually strengthen Van Gogh to be more visible so that it can carry out its duties as the umbrella organization. 
and it is the view. It is my view that uh, if uh, we see something wrong within the government, in the public sector, uh, before we start talking about how they should, what they have done wrong, it's best if uh, an organization like Van Gogh looks within itself, strengthens its governance structure, and shows that it has the enough resources so that it can actually make a difference. And that is how I view Van Gogh. If somebody is supposed to be holding public servants to account for the money that he spent, then I believe that Van Gogh should be uh, the voice that should be carrying it, uh, be standing in that position to fight. So with that, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Nasak, thank you very much for your presentation on talk. I um, listen with interest uh, on uh, uh, what, what I understand is uh, the difficulties that uh, exist even within the CSO sector um, in Vanuatu. So it sounds to me like um, both these gentlemen have a very good understanding of where the difficulties lie. And, and on that note, I would just like to encourage our um, um, participants, all of our, um, the audience uh, here today, please use the Q&A feature to send in your questions. I am also, of course, uh, taking some via um, direct message, uh, but just to give you a, a run through again, uh, Dr. William Tokon is, of course, um, the Chief Executive Officer of Charent Transparency International Vanuatu, a medical doctor by profession uh, with a stellar career in the medical field, but who of course um, ran a civil society career alongside his medical career and is now uh, Chief Executive Officer of Transparency International, who gave us a very thorough and comprehensive presentation looking at what the context is in Vanuatu, what the kind of difficulties um, that they go through, uh, the reality of corruption and the extent of it, and maybe some of the barriers and uh, that exists to uh, in, in terms of the difficulties they have addressing corruption. But he did give us, um, you know, a bit of insight into where the solutions may lie, and that is, of course, in civil education. And Mr. William Nasak, uh, I want to talk. My apologies. If I haven't got an updated um, um, introduction into your background, but as I understand it, he is um, senior education officer in the Ministry of Education and Training in Vanuatu, dealing with policy development. Uh, so lots of education, lots of training in and around the corruption space. Uh, but he does come to us today um, to talk about what it means to be number 45 on the corruption perception index um, of the world. And uh, like Mr. Nasak mentioned, um, that position is kind of midway, not too bad and not too good. But the alarming part of that uh, rating is that it has been stagnant. And uh, as you know, when you work in the anti-corruption space, you really do want uh, those ratings to improve. And Mr. Nasak, of course, brought us uh, quite a bit of insight into the difficulty in terms of corruption space within um, the CSO and the NGO space in Vanuatu. So quite a lot of challenges. And so we will now go directly into the questions. Uh, and we have um, a few that came to us using the Q&A feature, uh, mostly at the moment directed um, towards you, uh, Dr. Tokon. And so um, for the rest of you who have questions, uh, for Mr. Nasak, uh, please feel free to send them directly to me or to use um, Q&A feature, which I am keeping a very close watch on. Um, so Dr. Tokon, um, straight to you and please feel free to keep your mic uh, on so we can have a more interactive conversation. The first uh, question that I had uh, arose from um, your description of the kind of population you're dealing with, that 75% of your population live in the rural area and the rest are uh, urbanites. And when you talk about the fact that uh, in, in, in your professional opinion, uh, the, the biggest uh, issue is the lack of civic education and the lack of civic awareness as to you know what corrupt practices may be and what people's civic duty may be. Um, how much of a cut 
government work, in your opinion, is directed towards the rural people, um, those, those, those stakeholders who are working to raise awareness, are they customizing their programs to suit the rural population? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lite. Uh, uh, okay. The uh, let me, yes, about seventy-five percent of our, the population in the country live in the rural areas, and only about 20, 25 live in the urban areas. Uh, when we talk about uh, civic education, we. Uh, as William will uh, uh, probably uh, uh, can support me on this or can uh, elaborate a little bit more on this, but in terms of, uh, I think the last two years, the, the government of Vanuatu has realized that uh, it, needs, uh, it needs a civil society to, to actually reach out to these people. So that's why uh, recently in the last two years, we've been working, uh, uh, CSOs and uh, NGOs have been working very closely with with the government in some areas. Like we combined the two 16 day activism in November, December, like we're doing now. So uh, actually uh, in my experience, one of the few things is, you know, like I said earlier on, a lot of these places, people in the uh, rural areas, they see, uh, they see common officials every four years during campaign and during election time. What we're trying to do, and uh, transparency has been trying to do, and most of the CSOs that come under Banco and uh, William, is uh, we're trying to make sure that these people know what's happening. So we try to advocate on uh, RTI, how to access RTI, uh, get information. Is there still a, a bit of uh, uh, issue with that, the uh, RTI Act, uh, was supposed to be uh, enforced by the uh, a commissioner, RTI commissioner. Is still uh, uh, the commissioner has not been appointed since the office was set up in 2017. So that's a big issue. So you have pe this 75% uh, of the population in the rural areas who who do not have access to right and uh, correct and up to date information. That's a big issue. Uh, so. Uh, uh, as the answer to your question, uh, we've seen some changes. We've seen some communities uh, uh, sort of uh, that we have visited and they're asking for revisits. They're asking for more information. They come to the office, transparency office and get information. Now that the big issue is the 44, 45 uh, CSOs that come under Vanco these people do not have the capacity to do that. There's funding, they have to do printing. Uh, what we do is when we go to the rural areas, because we, we go once every three, two, three years, we need to leave behind printed material. We don't have uh, capacity to do that. Transparency is trying to do it. Hopefully, when we have the full revival of our banco, we should be able to do that. So people have information on their hand for reference. So people cannot go and uh, visit us from uh, urban areas. Politicians cannot go and uh, give false information to us. They will have reference information with them. Does, does that answer your question? It does, it does. Thank you, Willie. And, and I think um, another question that arises from that, and I, I see a few of the Q&A uh, feature questions asking the same thing. How much is social media being used uh, to uh, both directly address corruption or to do more proactive civic education awareness programs? And, and how effective is that? What's, what's the internet situation in Vanuatu um, in terms of the access that rural people have? It, it's quite good, but that, uh, most of the information on the social media, uh, you know, some of them are uh, good, correct information. A lot of it is uh, not, not correct or not up-to-date information. So I'm a little bit hesitant. Uh, there are some groups that uh, I trust 
with the information, but the, uh, a lot of uh, information on social media is not quite, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not adequate or sometimes it's not correct. So if you go to a face, Facebook page, uh, you will probably get good information. But if you go on general Facebook, uh, probably the information is, uh, it can be questioned. Yes. But, uh, coverage, coverage is very good. Mr. Nasak, can I just bring you in at this point? As, as the chair of the Vanuatu Association of Non-Government, uh, as the president of the Vanuatu Non-Government Association, how effective do you think your members uh, are using social media to do their awareness work, especially around civic duties? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think the... Uh, let me just make a correction here. I don't work for the education. That's my son. I used to um, sorry. work sorry. as the. Um, I used to work um, in the government as the permanent secretary to the Ministry of Agriculture. Then, as the, then I was transferred on to the Ministry of um, <laughs> um, Youth and Sports as the permanent secretary there. Uh, to do with civil education, I would have to say that. Um, let me put, let me paint the picture this way. Um, when we were growing up, they said that um, if you didn't do well in school, then you would be sent to the islands. So you could see that most of the people who are successful in education get to go on further studies and they come up and they work in, in the urban areas. While most of the people who didn't do well in school, they were sent back to the islands and they elected most of the people back there, which are within the government at the moment. And I would have to say, people can say that uh, the education, but I think it comes down to a lot of factors. Um, it comes out to the economic uh, power for each individual and whether they have that economic power to in, um, refuse uh, certain gifts that are given by politicians. I think um, if they don't have that, um, capacity, then they tend to accept it. And no matter how much we talk, people will still tend to go that. And then in Vanuatu, we call it a uh, belly ticks, meaning uh, you talk with your bell, your belly. So um, yeah. I think that's something that we have to keep uh, trying to influence. Thank you. Um, uh, gentlemen, a question for both of you. Um, are there some features in your culture and tradition which kind of rationalizes corrupt practices. So for example, we, we've seen it in, we saw it in, in Papua New Guinea, we saw it when we discussed the Solomon Islands contact. And I can say that even in Fiji, there's some parts of our culture that make it seem that it's okay to receive this, um, as you called it, William, uh, gifts eh? or freebies is what we call it here in Fiji. And so you have that uh, reciprocal relationship where you feel you have to do what they ask you, even if you know it's wrong. Can you tell us if there are some parts of um, your uh, culture, indigenous culture that uh, is like that? I think I'll go first before um, Dr. Willie Tokon. I think um, all across Vanuatu, before you enter any village, uh, there's a token of, um, well, they say token of appreciation and for the chiefs allowing you to go in there. But when it comes down to election, you don't know what is handed over. And the chiefs can has, have quite a lot of influence. I come from a province down south. And if you could influence the chiefs, then you probably would get all the voters in the village. Thank you. Doctor? Sorry. Yes, this is a common uh, practice. It's a cultural practice. It's a, uh, it's a show of respect. When you go to a village, you, you go and meet the chief. Uh, uh, and then you, you do what you have to do. Uh, but uh, uh, and we also have uh, reciprocity in, in terms of if uh, one man is uh, paying a bright price for his son, uh, pe people, everybody contributes and he sees what, what, uh, what people bring. So when another person 
who came to contribute is doing the same thing next year. This, this man will go and give the same thing, maybe a little bit more as a thank you for, for helping him. But you know, this is a random thing. It's usually done uh, at any time. But now it seems like uh, it's becoming a practice uh, every four years, people go and do this kind of thing. Uh, and the sad thing is that because these people in the rural areas have so much respect, like I said, in, I mentioned it in my uh, earlier talk, when they see uh, a bag of rice or 5,000 watu, when, when I try to tell them that, you know, they may give you money, they may give you food, but when you vote, you vote for somebody who has integrity, who is fair, who is honest, they stand up and say, how can you say that? He came and gave me this, this thing. I have to, I have to vote for him. Uh, but, and the other thing about uh, what William said is, uh, actually it's, it's, it's worse in some, uh, some areas. When, uh, when somebody goes and uh, gives something to the chief and the chief is happy, when he leaves, the chief can, act, uh, we have actually have cases where the chief can say, okay, everybody here, they have to vote for this man. And he knows the number of people who will vote. If one person doesn't vote for this man and the, the count comes and they say this village has 900 people, only 99 uh, people voted for this man. Where, where did the other one person go? So it, it's, it's difficult for, uh, for our people on the ground when we have this traditional uh, respect and uh, and yeah, doctor, can I just interrupt you there? And there's, there's a question that, that came up um, and, and it's very relevant right this moment. Um, so in, in a community that small, uh, can, can the secrecy of votes and, and ballots be maintained? Or is it easy then for the community to identify you know, who hasn't voted according to the chief's will and are they victimized? Does that happen? Actually, uh, I was talking to the a, a woman leader in uh, in Williams uh, on Williams Island, and there was a case where this thing happened, and one woman uh, voted for somebody from another village, and everybody knew. One thing is when the chief asks, she she cannot say it's me uh, or it's not me. She cannot lie. And uh, the sad thing was, she was uh, sort of uh, assaulted. And when the husband tried to help her, he was also assaulted. So this, uh, sorry, William, but I, this is what I got from uh, uh, one woman leader from the, from the island. I'm sure it happens on other islands. You know, the, the husband will say, okay, you all know, the chief has said we vote for this man. On my island, sometimes the family splits up and said, okay, you, you, are, you will go and vote for this guy, we will vote for this person. So it's sometimes it's, even though when we go to the communities, like we do with transparency, we tell them when you are in the booth, the only person who knows who you're gonna vote for is you and God above, nobody else. Your husband doesn't know, but it, it still happens. All, it's like, it's an open book. Everybody knows who voted for this man, who voted for this man. <laughs> so do they know because the electoral systems are not private or is there a fear that people will know? I think um, I will add here. Um, Vanuatu, villages are so small and people tend to know everything about a person who lives next to them. And uh, like why, where I come from is that when the chief says, okay, I have about 50 people, you 25, you vote for a certain people, certain person, and then you the other half votes for these people. He actually guarantees that. He actually tells the politician when they come to the, nakama, uh, to the, to the meeting house. And then he already identifies who's going to vote for who. If in between now and you vote, then they will know exactly who voted and who doesn't vote. I think um, it's, uh, I'm not sure how, what do you call it, but um, 
people tend to be followed. We have followed that system for quite some time. And it's also to say that um, we don't disrespect any of the politicians. If he, if he comes late, if he comes late, and then the chief should just tell him, sorry, you should have come last week. I've already divided my village on how they will vote. So. Wow. <laughs> I, it's, it's very interesting to, uh, you know, to examine the way that our cultural practices are very similar, I have to say, and also um, the, the way that they provide uh, and, and drive corrupt practices. Uh, sounds to me like this, this quite a lot, uh, uh, Dr. Tokon had mentioned, there's quite a lot of uh, education and awareness that needs to be done at the very grassroots level. Um, so we've talked about how our um, cultural and, and traditional practices can drive corruption, but we found out when we dealt with Papua New Guinea a lot, and also with the Solomon Islands last week, that there are also cultural practices that are uh, anti-corruption or that we can use to address the corrupt practices that we're seeing in our communities. Can you tell me, um, are there any like that in Vanuatu that we should be highlighting or, you know, which provide entry points for CSOs um, to help to discourage corrupt practices? Uh, I, would, I would say here that there are ways and it comes down to a very strong leader in the village and he should be the one who would be championing the civic education to educate its uh, people. I think uh, having very weak um, um, heads of village uh, enables the politicians to actually influence them. Um, I come from a village where uh, my father is the chief and he actually tells people, you vote for who you want to vote and you have no right to, nobody has any right to influence you. And I always believe that it comes down to a very powerful person who stands up in front and then takes the lead and tells people what they can do and what, they, what, um, they, what their rights are. And if it's a weak person, then I think the politicians will take the lead and they will tend to influence, they have the influence. That's my view of it. Thank you. Yes, I I, um, I thank you very much for that, uh, William. I think that that's actually a very smart idea and one that is universal to the entire Melanesian region is just work with what you have. Eh? Look at the leadership structure that's in place and um, for want of a better description, infiltrate from the top, educate and empower our chiefs to know that it's their right to make their own decisions and that they can pass on that right to their people. Um, so just to move away from, there's been quite a lot of questions on, um, on culture and tradition uh, and how they can either drive or address uh, corrupt practices. I'm just looking very quickly to see that there aren't any more um, so I can move on to the next area that, that a lot of, um, that the two of you have touched on that a lot of questions have come from and that's um, the public sector. So there's a comment that's come from Teddy Wynn. Um, CPI data in general come from each country's public sector. What is your opinion or view of corruption within private sector? Uh, and, and I'd like both of you to, to have a say, uh, because I think the, um, the implication there is that private sector can influence public sector. And I think if we're honest, we know that happens in a lot of our societies. So tell us about private sector corruption in Vanuatu? I think I will start before um, Dr. Willie goes in. I think uh, with all developing Melanesian countries, I would have to say that uh, the private sector has a lot of influence in corrupting our officials. Um, they get the bulk of the money. Um, they get the bulk of the money for tendering um, contracts and you keep wondering how some people get the contracts even though they go through a fair process and then you wonder how certain contracts are done and they're not completed and where does the money go was the money uh, calculated accurately or did some of the money go elsewhere that i am not sure but and then it happens within my country um, you see a road that has been spent, it could be a hundred million. And then after two, three years, the road is damaged. And then we're starting to have a new contract. And the same person takes the contract again. 
and you wonder how the politician gets to fund his election and how he gets to have certain things within his constituency. And then you wonder, okay, this person has been working and under his um, leadership, he appoints people to evaluate contracts. And then they, and from the evaluation, the person, the chairman of the tender board gets to appoint them. Whether the tender board, and the tender board is, uh, chairman is um, appointed by the government of the day. And so there's no fair, if they, or even though they say they go through the fair process, you don't know whether he was the best qualified person for the job or was he, was he appointed to the job just so that um, uh, the party could satisfy his needs. And I would say the public sector has a lot of influence uh, because I say, it's almost like a triangle. The money comes out, it goes to the private sector. The private sector gets to clear the money, some for the contract can. They say that you also have to show your appreciation for the person who awards you the contract. And I'm not sure if that is done, but I, I, you can see it happening, but there's no clear evidence of it happening. Mm, kickback. So Dr. Dr. Willy, what, what's your take? Is the private sector in, is there a big corruption problem in the private sector or not? Uh, I think it is. That's why uh, I was actually in a meeting uh, on uh, Tuesday this week uh, with uh, with my uh, with our funders in uh, Berlin, and, and we, we Transparency One or Two would like to look at uh, a few things next. One is uh, the tendering process, the government tendering process. Mm. Two is the uh, political party uh, funding. And this, uh, and we already have the uh, annual returns, which is very good. Uh, like I mentioned earlier on, some uh, some people have been uh, prosecuted and sentenced for not submitting. You wonder why they don't. Uh, These uh, high high government officials don't want to reveal the annual uh, annual returns. You wonder why. Uh, but what William must said is true. The tendering process. Uh, in, in relation to that, the private sector drives, drives the corruption uh, in the government. I mentioned in my slide there on, uh, earlier on that plenty of, uh, plenty of government officials, especially senior officials, they have private companies. They have uh, construction companies. And these companies uh, under their wives or their brother's names, they get all these contracts. And it's very common. I mentioned earlier on about the road, uh, road work on Pentecost that was supposed to be uh, cost about 170 million uh, when uh, the former prime minister was there this, uh, last week. He heard, that, uh, he heard the amount was uh, 80, 80 million. So he was saying, he was asking in the Daily Post newspaper, where has 90 million gone to? And this is a common thing. Uh, what okay. William has said is true. These people get all these uh, tenders. They do some work. Sometimes it's not complete. Sometimes okay. it's completed, but very, very, uh, very poor quality work. So when our heavy rains come in uh, November to April, by May, June, everything has been washed away, especially road work and buildings. So yes, uh, these are things that uh, need to be looked at and uh, the legislation strengthened, uh, but it's difficult when the chairman of the board is appointed by the, the government of the day. <laughs> it sounds to me I, I, that the next question I was going to ask was around you know the checks and balances systems within the tender processes and you know scrutiny. Uh, it sounds to me like you've already answered that question. Then, so we don't have, if at all, we don't have effective. Uh, accountability and transparency checks within the, the government tendering system. Uh, what about in terms of audits, post-project audits? Uh, do, does, does the Auditor General's office have the teeth it needs to conduct its, its work, do you think, gentlemen? Uh, well, Dr. Like, can I, can I just add here is that uh, 
I don't know whether to call it checks and balances, but um, there is, uh, if something happens when the, a government is in, in power, and then he, there's, uh, well, certain money have been used. And then during the term, nobody would talk about it. And when the new government comes in, they, they find out that there's, this has happened. And then they investigate, they appoint a commission of inquiry to investigate. I don't know whether it's called with some checks or balances, but I think it's mainly just to ensure that the, his rivalry doesn't get back into parliament into the power. Um, on, uh, on the Auditor General, I would have to say, we need to strengthen our Auditor General. Basically, he just looks at the, he just checks a few annual reports and checks what the, and then the, the parliament sit down and they question people about what they should be carrying out. But uh, uh, in the annual report, and that makes it, uh, I, I think that's very weak because it does not hold the public servants. After some time, if you go to the public accounts committee for some time, you tend to know exactly what the, what you, what is required from you. So you tend to have it already. And if it's already, then they won't even question you. They will just basically tell you if the money was used there or how did the money come in. But um, you people tend to lie a lot. So I would, I would just leave it at that. Wow, uh, that's a very um, deep look. I, I'm, um, I'm quite. Uh, I don't know if the right word is amazed, but amazed at the situation there. And and uh, I, I guess one of the obvious uh, questions we, we're seeing this um, happen here in Fiji, at least, where the CSO community, um, the NGO community, are demanding. Uh, uh, a role uh, demanding better accountability and demanding um, a place in terms of the monitoring and evaluation of our public finance uh, management systems. So for example, this year for the first time, uh, our version of uh, Vango, uh, Mr. Nasak, I was able to get an audience with the Minister of Economy and the Minister of National Planning uh, to be part of the budgetary process and to be part of the monitoring evaluation process. Uh, as an example, um, what, what is the situation in Vanuatu? Do CSO actors such as yourselves have a place in the public finance mechanisms of the country? Do you have a say in the way budgets are allocated, in the way budgets are uh, budget disbursement is monitored? Uh, honestly speaking, um, um, I think when you're not within the, any of the government ministries, then you're basically not part of the budgetary process. Um, you just learn about the, what budget is available that the government is appropriating for use when it goes to parliament or when the report comes three years after for a particular, and then you get to look at it. But um, the budgetary, the budget process now, Nobody is part of it apart from um, those who are within the public sector. Dr. Can, can I just make a comment here? Yes, uh, uh, this is very true. The civil society, CSOs, they are uh, not involved with the budget process. Uh, so actually the, the last meeting we had, uh, Earlier this year, uh, we managed to get uh, one, uh, one officer from the eighth coordinating, uh, eighth coordinating unit from the prime minister's office. And he actually came and told us, you know, this is the process. If you are, if you are doing this work, you can go to this ministry and talk to them about getting involved. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, uh, organization. That's why we we uh, we working on uh, one code. Sorry, it, that's why we it's almost like an afterthought. Eh? It's not their normal well, protocol to involve you. Eh? Yeah. So uh, so, but hopefully, uh, as we go, uh, as we uh, become stronger with Banco, hopefully we can actually request that uh, you know our our uh, our member associations. You know, they would uh, they, they should be involved with uh, because they're doing work, and it's good now that the government has uh, realized that uh, the, the, it needs 
CSOs to do that uh, awareness work and advocacy work on, uh, on behalf of the government. Uh, but they need to give us that support and they need to involve, they involve the CSOs and NGOs in the process of this so that we can be part of it. Uh, Vanco can be part of it. So uh, there's still a lot of work to, right now we're not involved, like uh, William said, but uh, hopefully we in, come in the coming uh, years, we should be able to uh, get involved and uh, become more effective, uh, but we need that support from the government. I, I thank, you. thank you so much, gentlemen. I think that um, one of the really exciting parts of this um, this webinar series is being able to learn from each other as as uh, you know countries in the same region of the Pacific with very similar uh, everything really similar cultural, similar sociological situation, similar economic situation, but most definitely similar culture and traditions. Eh, is that we can we can learn a lot from each other's best practices, and I'm hearing you. Um, I'm hearing the frustration uh, that that you're you know facing and and all of the challenges that that are stacked against you. But um, and so I, I'm happy that we could talk about the fact that here um, public finance management or, or public finance issues is uh, was this year a very strong part of the CSO community here. You know, like pushing and articulating the fact that because as you say, Dr. Tokon, you're doing the work on the ground, you have a role to play in first of all, raising people's awareness so that they know that uh, you know, public finance systems are their systems, but also uh, raising the government's awareness to the fact that monitoring and evaluation is also your role as well. So um, pretty exciting times ahead of us, I think. And, and I'm really grateful to International Idea for providing this platform. And so um, I'm conscious that we are almost out of time, but because we started a bit late, just a little bit late. Um, the second, the next set of questions is in and around legislation and, and policy frameworks that can um, help you to do your work, yeah? help you to do your work around awareness, help you to also do your work around uh, monitoring and evaluating and holding governments accountable. So. Can you tell us what is the exist what what's the existing uh, legislative framework in Vanuatu that makes it possible uh, for anti uh, for, for anti corruption initiatives to take place? So, like for example, do you have whistleblower legislation? Uh, what kind of legislation is it, and and does it protect? Uh, sources, um, as you said, you are at the mercy of public servants, whether they want to teach you about uh, budget uh, systems, whether they want to involve you or not, is, is, is up to them. So um, is there legislation in place that protects uh, whistleblowers, people who uh, come and tell us about corrupt government officials? I think I'll go ahead and then Dr. Willie Dukun can come later. Um, so far, I would have to say um, there's um, this, if you were, to, you want to be a whistleblower, then like the saying goes in Vanuatu, do it at your own risk. Um, I think uh, a lot of people are really, uh, I think we, we have a public service, we have a public service, but it is more or less the association that was supposed to be uh, public service, public service association. I think that was dismantled after about in I think it was in the 1990s, and then there has never been the public service organization has never been grouped up together. And then um, uh, most people who tend to see the wrongs, they tend to be scared about talking about it because there's no mechanism to actually protect them. And if you think of doing something right, there's uh, always somebody who sees that uh, they are threatened and they will always have a way to ensure that your employment status um, does not continue. So a lot of, it makes a lot of people very hesitant on coming forward to talk about um, what practices that are corrupt. Yes, uh, Thank you, uh, thank you, William. It's uh, I think that's a very good and a frank way of putting it. Uh, I don't know about his experience, but uh, I uh, I am a living proof that in the, in public service, 
if you're doing something right, it means you're making hard decisions, you will be kicked out for some reason. Uh, and I, I can tell you that because uh, I've been kicked out Does two it times. To you? Yes. Mm. And uh, but I respect authority, so uh, I, uh, you know I accept whatever is uh, uh, whatever decision is made. But that's a very true uh, picture of things. Uh, if you're doing your a good work, and you are, it means you'll probably be stepping on a few toes. It won't be long before there's uh, some allegations and you get kicked out. So uh, status quo is uh, what's happening. Uh, in terms of legislation, the, now, uh, William has just said, in the Ministry of Internal Affairs, there's a test called NGO desk. There's a policy that is supposed to uh, say something about the government working with the CSOs and Banco. Uh, it hasn't been uh, successful in the past. Uh, but uh, hopefully now with William, uh, uh, William's leadership, we're looking forward to uh, uh, doing that. Le legislation is something that CSOs and NGOs are hesitant to sort of get involved in because uh, we don't want the government to be uh, telling us what to say and what not to say, especially if they're supporting uh, the CSOs and uh, Vanco. So that's something that a lot of people have, uh, members uh, have spoken against, but I think uh, teamwork is good. Discussions, uh, open discussion, frank discussions are good. Uh, so hopefully, uh, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've been doing some, uh, one of the things that uh, William mentioned earlier on in his presentation was, the government is now starting to see that CSO representation need to be on board, board or no, committees, uh, which is good because we need to see transparency, fairness, and honesty in the in all the dealings. So, if if that representation can uh, involve making good fair decisions, then that's what we want. Uh, that that would go a long way towards fighting uh, corruption. Thank you. Dr. Tokum, thank you so much. You're absolutely correct. You are indeed living um, example of what happens when you are a public servant and you see wrong and you highlight it in order to make a right. And uh, it doesn't always happen that way. I, uh, uh, you seem to have landed in quite the right place, I, if, I might, if I may add, <laughs> uh, to be able to do really important work in, in you know, holding power to account. Um, thank you so much for sharing that, um, that experience with us. And thank you, Mr. Nasak, um, for that very brutal, but uh, seemingly very accurate way of putting it. You, blow the whistle at your own risk. I, um, I note that uh, uh, according to the United Nations anti-corruption programs, Vanuatu does have uh, whistleblower um, uh, legislation uh, uh, quite like Fiji and like Vanuatu, uh, sorry, and like the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea as well, but uh, maybe it's um, the way in which we are actually protected under that legislation that requires a bit of attention. Um, so that answers uh, quite a few questions um, from Vicky, from Teddy, uh, from myself and from uh, a few other of our um, uh, participants this morning. And, and at this point, I want to say thank you very much to all of our participants, uh, Sean Paul, Saul Edward, Teddy Wynn, um, our anonymous attendees, Vicky, Vicky Prakash, Ardash Kumar, uh, and especially Teddy Wynn for being so participatory today. Um, this is probably the most busiest times I've seen our Q&A uh, feature in the three webinars. It's just been blowing up. So uh, Dr. Tokon and Mr. Nasak, you have uh, uh, quite a lot of fans this morning. Uh, and so we're heading towards the end of our time, but I have time for one more question or at least one more comment. And that's from Teddy Wynn. And I'll just read it out. In my 
own research on government corruption in Papua New Guinea, citizens thought that theoretically they are willing to report corruption, but in reality they can't because of social uh, security and economic costs associated with reporting that corruption. In other words, they do not trust that the whistleblower laws can effectively we protect them. And I think that both of you um, have outlined both in your presentations and in the questions that you answered earlier, what that actually means. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you now to make your parting remarks by responding uh, to Teddy Wynn's last um, question there. If you can make some parting remarks uh, directly in response to him and also any other remarks you might like to make as we close off this session. I'll read it again before I ask you Dr. Tokon uh, to speak and then Mr. Masak. In my own research on government corruption in Papua New Guinea, citizens thought that theoretically they're willing to report corruption, but in reality they can't because of the social security and economic costs associated with reporting that corruption. In other words, they don't trust whistleblower laws uh, to protect them. Dr. Tokon. Thank you. That, that's a very, uh, very true uh, scenario for uh, Vanuatu as well, I might, I might say. Uh, if if I, if I can just remind us about the, the result of the global uh, corruption barometer, the most the most corrupt institutions in the ten Pacific countries are the president of the prime minister's office. The second most corrupt are the parliamentarians. Number three is, is the police, law enforcement. Number four is civil servants. So yes, it is true. Uh, imagine you you want to go and make a report to uh, to the police about a police uh, corrupt activity. Yeah, it it will not work. Uh, and yes, uh, it's actually uh, the scenario is actually worst in Vanuatu because in Vanuatu we all know each other. We everybody knows each other. So when you uh, when you when you speak out. Everybody knows, oh, that person is talking about us or is talking, uh, it's going to put us in trouble. So I, I won't be surprised if it's the same thing in the Solomons. And uh, here, maybe Fiji, not so much. Uh, people are a little bit different there. But in Vanuatu, like uh, William mentioned earlier, we, we all know each other. So yes, it can be a threat. Uh, so. But also some people are afraid to report on their relatives. With in the marriages now, I'm, I, uh, I'm probably related to uh, William in the South. My island is in the North because I have relatives, uh, girls married to uh, people, uh, boys from his island. So when you are, uh, when you're related, re related, uh, well, your friends, school friends, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So yes, some people, they know something is wrong. They, they witness corrupt activity, but it's difficult to, uh, to report for all those reasons. So I don't know how we're gonna sort this out. Uh, we, we always talk about rights, other people's rights and your rights and your responsibilities. Uh, but like I said, we have our culture. We have our traditional respect for each other and our leaders. So it's a big issue as well. So, uh, you know, when our, our leaders meet in Kirpas or in Fiji or in uh, Tenerao and they talk about, you know, all these things, there's a lot of challenges when you go to implement all these things on the ground because of, we have all these uh, relationships and uh, cultural practices that are around. So we look forward to, uh, basically, we need to educate our people much better. They need, they, need, they need to know what is corruption, what is bribery. They need to know their rights. And they need to know that corruption does not go with development. Whatever this corruption, there will be no, no development. I think that's, that would be my parting idea. We educate our community uh, leaders and our community <coughs> citizens uh, on uh, corruption and let them know that when there's corruption, there can be no development. Thank you. 
that's quite a poignant point there, uh, Dr. Tokwan. Thank you very much. You absolutely ended it on a wonderful note. You're right. Corruption gets in the way of development, and uh, there is a monetary figure attached to that as well. I, I can't say it right now, but I know that it's in the millions um, the amount of money we deny our communities when we allow corruption uh, to continue. Dr. Tokwan, thank you so much for your time. It has been wonderful listening to you and hearing about your experience. Um, Mr. Nasak, your parting remarks, please. Uh, fighting, um, well, fighting corruption within the, within our Melanesian culture can be quite, well, it is, it is a difficult topic because most of the people you would be accusing are your own families. And, um, now, uh, now being in, within the NGO sector, I find that a very good way for us to tackle, uh, issues uh, well, when we look at the issues of corruption, is that the NGO community has to be very strong. It cannot be divided. If there's an issue that comes up, we just can't go and open our mouths without having the proper facts and properly research. And we have to make sure that our lines are dotted and we ourselves as NGO are solid because at any time we go out there, we might be accusing our own families, but we, we should, the people should uh, understand that we are talking for the better of our country. And part of the NGO is to be holding the government accountable. And we have to do our research properly, have the evidence so that the evidence, people can go back and check the evidence and they know we've done it right. And that is how I see an NGO playing part in it. And I would like to see NGOs, if, um, uh, because I see, when you look at the parliament, there's an opposition in the parliament that holds the government to account on what it does. And then you wonder who does that for the public servants? And if nobody's doing, then the NGO has to step up on that role. And I see Van Gogh, taking that spot and I'm, we've worked with a lot of people and I'm hoping that once we get the governance structure in place, then the smaller people who have issues, we can actually check the issues that they have, research it properly so that we can have our story straight. And whenever it needs to go to court, then we have the resources to ensure that proper procedures are followed and people are held accountable and we have the data to back it up. And that is how I see NGOs fighting. Because if nobody takes the leading role, then I'm afraid we will be still talking about this next year and after, the years after. Thank you. Uh, my uh... One, my goodnight and thank yous to both of you, uh, Dr. Tokon and Mr. Nasak, for your very frank, very honest um, uh, sharing here today. Uh, we appreciate very much the time you've taken to prepare presentations to give us information about what the, the situation is in Vanuatu. And we're hearing the need for a big philosophical change. We're hearing um, that you're looking uh, for support to, to raise people's consciousness about you know, their rights, their responsibilities, but also what they stand to lose if they're not fighting corruption. Uh, we're hearing also um, your assertions that there is a need to strengthen existing structures, uh, structures of the government itself uh, facing corruption, structures um, of the CSO community who need to play a very vital role in holding government agencies to account for the power that they have and the resources they have at their disposal. Uh, uh, they, I've, I've, I'm sure I speak for um, all of our participants uh, today when I say that we've learned quite a lot. And so on that note also, I want to thank all of our wonderful participants, uh, everyone who's here today, a special mention uh, to Mr. Teddy Wynn, who is um, uh, also a wonderful
Talk from Papua New Guinea and is a PhD scholar at James Cook University in Australia. Thank you very much, Teddy. I felt like you were a co-host on this panel uh, with all of the questions that was coming through from you. Uh, thank you as well to all of the other participants who are sending questions through. This is by far the most um, busiest uh, Talanoa segment of the three webinars that we have conducted. And on that note, also, I would like to, um, on behalf of International IDEA, Asia and Pacific's regional office, uh, say thank you to the two gentlemen and to everyone. And also, I uh, would just like to remind everyone listening in and those who may have been with us earlier that the statements, views, and opinions expressed um, in the presentations made today um, do not necessarily represent the institution position of international idea, its board of advisors, or a council of member states. But on that note, I would like to say thank you very much to everyone. Uh, that is the end of our, our webinar series and uh, definitely of today's. Please stay in touch and follow International IDEA on Twitter and on Facebook and on their website for more information about democratic initiatives which encourage conversations that matter in the Pacific. everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Token, Mr. Nasak, Lide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, thanks. We'll be contacting you guys soon. Naka.